disease. Okay. Uh, we can begin or we are waiting for more people. Uh, will we, are we waiting for Professor Matlick here or? He said he'll join us yeah. in the process. He'll join us. Okay. Uh, Doctor, do you mind me recording the class? It's okay. Thank you. We can begin. Recording in progress. I'll be taking you through chronic kidney disease. Um, so how do we define chronic kidney disease? I know you did uh, acute kidney injury last, uh, last week. So chronic kidney disease is defined by impaired renal function for at least three months based either on an abnormal structure or abnormal function. So if you find a patient who maybe has a abnormal urinalysis persistently for three months, or they have a, a abnormal renal ultrasound for persistently for three months, that qualifies them to have chronic kidney disease. Or you can define them based on their GFR. Is a patient who has a GFR of less than 60 ml per minute uh, for greater than three months with or without any evidence of kidney damage. So the chronic kidney disease is, uh, is classified based on the GFR. There are five stages. So stage one is a patient who has a GFR which is above 90 ml per minute. And this patient has a normal uh, kidneys. They do not have hypertension. They may or may not have hypertension or diabetes and their GFR is high, but they have evidence of renal damage. Maybe you do a urinalysis, you find they have some proteins. Maybe you do a renal ultrasound, you see that their kidneys are shrunken, but their GFR is essentially normal. Uh, stage two is a patient who has a GFR between 60 to 89. This is a slightly deranged GFR with or without evidence of any renal uh, damage. Stage three are divided into two stages. There's the A and the B. The A is a GFR between 45 to 59 with moderate reduction of the GFR without any, with or without any evidence of other renal damage. Well, stage B is between 30 to 44. Stage four now is a patient who is not getting into almost dialysis. So this GFR is between 15 to 29. And uh, stage five, now they're in end stage kidney disease. So stage one, as I said, their GFR is essentially normal. It's above 90 ml per minute, but they are identified by other abnormalities. Either these are patients who has type one diabetes and now come with macroalbuminuria, but their GFR is normal. Or maybe this patient has structural abnormalities. Maybe you do their renal ultrasound. You could see the enlarged kidneys or, or um, shrunken kidneys with an essentially normal GFR. So stage two, this patient now, the GFR is between 60 to 89. They may or may not have any evidence of renal dysfunction, and they they require no regular follow up with you no know, just a basic physician. You don't have to follow them up with a with a nephrologist. So stage one and stage two, they do not have any complications of CKD. That is, they do not have complications like anemia. They do not have uh, mineral bone disease. They may or may not have hypertension. Stage three is where most of the, our patients present. Uh, this is because uh, GFR has been shown to decrease with decreasing age. Whereby with, after the age of 30, there's a decrease of GFR by one ml per minute every year. One ml per minute every year. So, um, so most of the patients will present in this stage because they are decreasing their GFR based on their age and not because of uh, other comorbidities, the comorbidities that have made them to, to present with this, uh, this stage. Remember also hypertension tends, the prevalence of hypertension tends to increase with increasing age. So we'll see a lot of patients presenting with a GFR of this, uh, of this stage because of their, uh, their, their risk factors of their age and mainly because of their age. Then, so as I have said, it, stage three is divided into the rest into two stages. There's the A and the B. The A is considered to be low risk because we assume that this patient uh, has come in this stage because of their increase in age, and these are the patients with the GFR between 45 to 59. Uh, stage B is the, the ones who have a high risk of progressing into into end stage kidney disease. They may or may not present with a uh, CKD complication of anemia and hyperparathyroidism because it has been shown that at, uh, at this stage, between the GFR of 30 to 45 is when now 
the dysfunction of erythropoiesis occurs and also dysfunction of vitamin D metabolism occur. So they can start preventing at this stage, but when they're in stage four, they obviously now have to have these complications of anemia. They have the hyperphosphatemia. Most of these patients, when they come at this stage, they are hypertensive. And uh, the uh, high percent of them will progress now to end stage kidney disease. End stage kidney disease is the stage five, which is a GFR less than five. Uh, well, less than 15, sorry. Uh, the first line of treatment for this patient is uh, transplant. You can be able to afford. If they can't be able to afford, then you can uh, progress them to dialysis. Um, one thing to remember is that if any stage, stage one to stage five, in any patient present with albuminuria, it has been shown to be associated with worse progressive prognosis regardless of their EGFR. So for example, if you have this patient with a G1 on your... Than 90, and they have an albuminuria. Let's say they have a normal to mildly increased albuminuria of around less than 30 milligrams. These ones have low risk. Yet, of the same patient, even of the same category, the patient who has a high GFR more than 90, but now they have a high albuminuria that is more than 300 milligrams per gram. These patients have a poorer prognosis in comparison to a patient who has an albuminuria of A1. So if you see this patient who is the G1A3 has the same risk factor in comparison, uh, uh, the same with the patient with the G2A3, just because of the presence of albuminuria. So albuminuria has been shown to be associated with a worse prognosis in terms of uh, high risk of mortality and also cardiovascular mobility. So Kidigo. Has, uh, has tried to incorporate albuminuria in the classification of, uh, of, of, uh, of the CKD stages, just so that because now it has been shown that albuminuria has a poorer prognosis, just so that may account it in the, in the GFR. How do you estimate this uh, GFR? Anybody has an idea? How do you calculate this GFR? So you, the, the GFR is an estimated GFR. It's not an actual GFR. It's an estimated GFR. And you use uh, serum creatinine because creatinine uh, will be produced by the muscles. However, the problem with creatinine is it's affected by the gender and it's affected by the age and the ethnicity, ethnicity and also the muscle bulk of the patient. So if a patient has a high muscle bulk, you expect them to have a high creatinine level in comparison to a person of the same age who has a low muscle bulk will have a, a lower creatinine level. So because of this, they are created, just that may account for these variations, variations in the, gen, the gender, the age, and the ethnicity. So there is a modified renal diet calculation and the, the CKD epi. So the CKD epi has been, uh, CKD epi allows for this modification, though it has, not been, uh, it has not been validated for African population. So most of the time you'll find that this uh, GFR, this that you're talking about 90, 60 to 89, will be calculated using the CKD epi, which allows for this modification, though it has not been uh, validated for the African population. So what are the most common causes of CKD? Worldwide, the most common cause is diabetic nephropathy, uh, type two more commonly than type one. Other causes, especially in the developed world is chronic glomerulonephritis, where IgA and nephropathy is the most common one in the developed world. Uh, in other centers, you may find things like systemic disorders like SLE. In around 20% of patients in the developed countries, they tend to have a uh, unknown cause. Despite them doing a biopsy, they are not able to identify what would have caused this. It may present when it is too late, when their kidneys are shrunken, so you're not able to do a biopsy. So the, the cause of the CKD is not yet is not known. Hypertension has also been found to be a common cause. So uh, you have to remember that uh, CKD can lead to hypertension. Yet also hypertension itself can cause CKD. So there's an overlap here. 
Um, then other things like chronic pyonephritis, most commonly in children with a reflux nephropathy, but also can also occur due to nephrolithiasis. Polycystic kidney disease, uh, the most common one is adult polycystic kidney disease, uh, which is the most common inherited cause of chronic renal failure. And remember things like obstructive neuropathy, like uh, CA prostate and uh, BBH, so it is reversible, it can also lead to CKD. Some patients, they can have an uh, acute kidney injury that has not progressed to the uh, to CKD, either it was poorly uh, managed or just it's the sequela of the, of the disease. Uh, other rare things like chronic tubular, inter tubular interstitial nephritis and uh, amyloidosis, which are much which are really rare in especially in the in the developed countries. So, what are the risk factors of getting uh, CKD? Obviously, diabetes mellitus, as we have said, is the most common cause of CKD. So, any patient who has diabetes are at a risk of progressing to CKD. Hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, because uh, cardiovascular disease will decrease the renal perfusion of the kidneys and then now lead it to an acute kidney injury, then now which will progress to CKD if it is not well managed. Any patient with a structural renal tract pathology, maybe they have reflux, nef uh, reflux nephropathy, if they have uh, uh, if they have any obstruction in the in the in the, in the tract, it will lead to CKD. Any patient with a multisystemic disease like SLE will also put them at risk of getting uh, CKD. Patients who are just found uh, accidentally to have hematuria or proteinuria can also are also at risk of progressing to uh, CKD. Patients who have a family history of either stage five CKD, especially for hereditary causes of CKD. Patients who had childhood obesity, they have a high risk of getting CKD due to some conditions that occur due to obesity. Patients with advanced stage, remember I said that with age, after the age of 30, the GFR tends to decrease at a rate of one mil per minute every year. So with the advanced age, then your GFR will have really decreased. Patients with uh, African ethnicity, because they have mentioned there are their genes which put them at risk of getting uh, CKD in comparison to other races and patients obviously with a previous AKI. So how does patient with diabetes or hypertension then progress to CKD? So all of these conditions, the diabetes, the hypertension, the multisystemic disease, they'll all have their own ways of progressing, uh, of progressing to, to CKD. So, but the end well is that they will lead to the damage, damage to the endothelium of, of, uh, of some nephrons. So the remaining nephrons are forced to overwork and they're forced to overwork because of, uh, because of uh, activation of the renal and, and uh, angiotensin adulterone system, which now causes vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial, leading to increased uh, intergromerular pressures, which now will lead to uh, hyperfiltration and hypertrophy of the remaining nephrons. So initially, this adaptive process is is uh, is, uh, is is protective, uh, by the, the the kidney is able to maintain the the GFR despite the damaged uh, ne nephrons. But after some time, this adaptive pro process becomes maladaptive, such that now the kidney the remaining nephrons are not able to maintain this uh, GFR. Now it leads to proteinuria, and the proteinuria itself now it uh, it's directly toxic to the to the tubules, and also now because of all this proteinuria activation of the renal and aldosterone and adulterone aldosterone system, it needs it leads also to activation of the inflammatory mediators, which now will stimulate fibrosis and now which will heal with sclerosis. So whatever process has initiated, this will be the end stage. There will be some damage of, of some nephrons. Then the other remaining nephrons will try to, to compensate, and they'll do so by activation of the RAS. The RAS will cause uh, constriction of the efferent arterial, increase in the intraglomerular pressure, and that increase in the intraglomerular pressure will cause now the remaining nephrons to hypertrophy and also to hyperfiltrate. Initially, it is it is um, 
it is protective, but later it becomes maladaptive. So how will this patient um, present? So I want to try to bring out in the history possible causes. So you want to try diabetes in, uh, in history of diabetes either in the patient or in the first degree relatives, history of about hypertension, history of things like uh, multi-systemic diseases, this clearly in your, in, your, in your history. So you want to bring out history of things like uh, can lead to reflux and the property, especially in children. You want to bring out history of things like lower urinary tract symptoms because now uh, you're thinking of things like uh, obstructive uropathy, especially in men who have either BPH or uh, CA prostate. You also want to bring out history of things like drugs because remember that there are drugs which are nephrotoxic, they may lead to an AKI, which later will progress to CKD. You want to capture your history or any familiar history of any inherited uh, causes of CKD. So you, you want to bring out things like uh, things like ADPKD or any history of any first degree relative who has had issue with, uh, with their kidneys. Then the next thing that you want to bring out in their history is their current state uh, they presenting. So if they're in stage four, stage five, as I said, is when they present most of the time with their presentation. So you want to look for things like uremic symptoms because when they have now in stage kidney disease, they tend to accumulate, urea will tend to accumulate. So they'll present with things like anorexia, vomiting, fatigue, weakness, pruritus. Women will present with uh, amenorrhea and men will present with impotence. They will tend to be fluid overloaded. So you want to look for any signs of edema. Like either they can have ankle swelling, they may have some facial puffiness. Some may also present with uh, anasaka. They may present with dyspnea, especially if they have pulmonary edema. You want to you see whether you want to ask whether they what is their urinary output, especially if they have obstructive uropathy, they may present with oliguria. Yet, uh, some causes of CKD have been shown not to decrease the urinary output, but this is something that you want to capture in your history taken. So, when you look at them, you want to look for pala because one of the complications of CKD is that. Uh, it decreases erythropoietin produ production, this is by destruction of the, of the nephrons. So as the CKD progresses, then there'll be less nephrons remaining, able to produce uh, erythropoietin. So now this patient will tend to uh, present with uh, anemia. It's a nobocytic nomochromic anemia, typical of, uh, of uh, anemia of chronic disease. They make present with that, Yellowish tinge, but this is mainly with the Caucasians, not really with the with the African American, with the Af persons of African ethnicity. They may have purpura because they tend to have platelet dysfunction, so they you may have find some purpura, especially in the Caucasians. You want to check their blood pressure because I'll say it, uh, CKD and hypertension. Uh, CKD can lead to hypertension, and hypertension itself can also lead to CKD. So you want to check their blood pressure. You want to look whether they have any cardiac disorders because even cardiovascular itself can lead to CKD, but also the renal dysfunction can also lead to uh, disturbances of the cardiac system. You want to look for any signs of fluid overload. And if you're thinking of things like polycystic kidney disease, you want to check whether the, the kidneys are palatable. So also on the examination, I'll say generally, what, what you're asking them about because of signs of uremia, they'll be talking about anorexia, nausea, malaise. Um, they may have a, a metallic taste. Uh, when you look at them, they have a uremic frost. These are white crystals, especially on the forehead and sometimes on the scalp. They may have pruritus, extensive pruritus because of the urea accumulation. So if this urea accumulates in the CNS, they may present with encephalopathy. I don't know whether you've gone through the CNS series, but in the encephalopathy, they'll present with things like seizures. They'll pretend with, will present with change in the mental status, decreased memory and attention. They may have impaired sleep. If this urea accumulates in the cardiovascular system, they may present with pericarditis, where they may have a pericardial rub. You want to still look for things like hypertension, Want to look for things like uh, 
congestive heart failure and also cardiomyopathy. Hematology, as I say, they decrease their reporting uh, production, so they prevent the normocytic normochromic anemia. They tend to have uh, platelet dysfunction, so they may have some uh, bleeding tendency. So moving on to your lab work, so you've seen these patients, you're suspecting that they have CKD. You have uh, you've taken a thorough history and you're, from your history, you maybe identified that this patient their CKD is secondary to diabetes. So how do you want to work them up? So of course, the first thing you want to do is yeah, urea, uh, create electrolytes and creatinine levels. Because using the creatinine, you'll be able to, to stage this patient's CKD. And by staging, then you'll be able to determine how aggressive or how mild your management will be. So you want to do your urea, electrolyte, and creatinine levels. You want to check also your, your electrolytes because they tend to have a lot of electrolyte uh, disturbances, especially of potassium, of calcium, and phosphate. Uh, because with the decrease in CKD, we are, with the increase of CKD GF, uh, stages, they decrease their vitamin D metabolism, so they will tend to have a low calcium and a high phosphate because uh, phosphate is mainly uh, uh, excreted by the kidneys. So another test that you want to do is your complete blood count because of the anemia that they get, the normocytic normochromic anemia, and also because of their platelet dysfunction, you want to see how much platelets that they have. So you want to do other tests like a random blood sugar or a fat skin blood sugar to rule out the cause if the, the diabetes is the cause. You want to do your, your dipstick, your urinary dipstick, because you want to see uh, how much, if they have in proteinuria, how much protein do they have? And if you find maybe a dipstick or one plus proteins, do you want to progress and stage this proteinuria? Do you want to do something like albumin creatinine ratio, or you want to do your 24-hour urinary uh, albumin excretion? Then uh, an MCS, microscopic culture and sensitivity, just to, just to rule out that they do not have a concurrent infection that could be disturbing them. The next thing you want to do is your uh, your imaging. So you want to do a renal ultrasound. You need to see the state. They need to see the sizes of these kidneys, and you want to see um, the cortico, medullary differentiation, and even the anatomy. How many kidneys that these patients have? Because if the patient uh, has like an ectopic kidney, it could be the cause of why they have uh, CKD. If the patient has just one kidney, or if the sizes are different. All of these will help you in your diagnosis of the cause of the CKD. So how do you manage uh, these patients with uh, CKD? So um, first line of management, so as I said, so you have done your investigation, you have gotten the your serum creatinine. So you have used your serum creatinine, your, the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, and the ethnicity of the patient to calculate the EGFR. So you get your EGFR, you stage the patient, and now you decide according to the stage how aggressive or how mild you're going to be, you are going to manage this patient. So if the patient is in stage five, uh, we say that the, it is an EGFR less than 15. So this patient, you want to advise them on dialysis and you want to advise them about transplant. Because transplantation is a definitive management of, of CKD, of end-stage kidney disease. If the patient cannot afford transplant or if they are not a suitable candidate for transplant, you need to start them on, on dialysis. So these are the patients, the patient in stage four, stage stage one, if the patient is in stage one and stage two, this patient ideally should just be followed up by a physician. So this GFR is just bodily tree deranged. You want to advise them on lifestyle modification. So the first thing you want to advise them about the lifestyle is decrease their salt intake because this will decrease their blood pressure. So the goal blood pressure that you want to target is a BPO 130, 80. So if this patient in stage one and stage two comes maybe with a BPO 160, 90, you want to initiate your antihypertensive. So uh, I know you have done pharmacology. So the first line of antihypertensive that you want to initiate is your S or your B's. Because you have looked at the pathophysiology, we can remember the pathophysiology of uh, CKD is that the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system is activated. And this activation of this RAS system is what, um, with time, propagates this CKD. So the first line of, uh, of antihypertensive that you want to give this patient is CKD 
is an ACE or an ARP just to block this uh, RAS activate, activation. So you start them, initiate them all on an ACE or ARP targeting a BP of 138, but you do not want to give the ACE and the ARP together because they have been sure that when you give them together, there's a high risk of hyperkalemia. So you can use an ACE or an ARP, not, not the both of them together. Then the other state, now the other uh, ways of managing them will depend with how the patient has, has presented. So if the patient presents with proteinuria, this patient has heavy proteinuria, if you do your LFTs and you see their albumin, it's also low in correspondence to the proteinuria that they have. You want to advise them about uh, diet, about their diet. Ideally, you want to you don't want them to take a high protein diet diet, yet you do not want them to take a low protein diet, you just want them to take a moderate intake of protein. So you need to collaborate this with your nutritionist uh, about the amount of proteins and even the type of protein this patient is supposed to be taking. Again, if this patient now has come, is in stage one. The only thing that you find in your urinalysis is proteinuria. Their BPs are normal. Maybe they have a BP of 120, 80. At the same time, you want to initiate them on the S or your grass blockade, and we'll also now decrease in time the proteinuria. So I said the one of the maladaptive processes now the end stage because of the hyperfiltration and the hypertrophy is that the patient now will get proteinuria. Then uh, uh, the now the next thing you want to look at is their complications of CKD. So if this patient has a mineral bone disease, whereby they say because of decreased vitamin D uh, metabolism, so now they're losing a lot of nephrons. Remember the last stage of vitamin D metabolism, where you're changing it from 25 colecalciferol to 125 colecalciferol tends to occur in the kidney. So with decreasing loss of with increasing loss of nephrons, this conversion tends not to occur because now they're losing so many nephrons. So they're not converting the colecalciferol to 125 5 So they do not have vitamin D, which they require vitamin D. Normally we require vitamin D to absorb calcium from the gut. So they have a low calcium and they'll have a high phosphate because phosphate has been excreted uh, from the kidneys. So you want to replace their calcium level and you want to also replace their vitamin D because they do not have, they are not making vitamin D. So you, you can give them a calcium supplement and vitamin D, uh, things like alpha calcitol or calcitriol. Sometimes, okay, they are, uh, maybe this is too much, but at this, uh, the mineral bone disease uh, progresses, they can have tertiary hyperparathyroidism, whereby now the calcium is high and the phosphate is high with a high PTH. So this is the end stage of how this, uh, how this uh, mineral bone disease is progressing. So you can either uh, bind this calcium with the, with the calcium binders, uh, like calcium carbonate, or uh, or you can give uh, things that will be working at the, at the PTH, things like sinacalcin. Yeah. So the next thing that you want to do, you remember they also get tend to get anemia because they do not have, um, they're not producing erythropoietin from the kidney. So, but first, before you decide that it's really, remember that this patient in CKD has so many other things that will be killed, causing them to have anemia. <laughs> Of course, then uh, the top on the list is the fact that they're not producing erythropoietin. But you also have to think, you also have to remember that remember this patient has nausea, has vomiting, so their dietary intake may be low. So they could be having dietary, uh, a dietary intake of iron is low. They could also be having other conditions that could be causing them not to have enough, uh, enough things like vitamin B12. Maybe they have, uh, they have decreased the intake of, uh, of meat, which is the main source of B12. Maybe they do not have enough source of folate. So before you decide that it is just the erythropoietin that is low, first thing you do is that CBC, and you want to see the HP and the MCV, so you can see what type of anemia it is. And you want to do your iron study, so you want to do a ferritin level, which we expect to be normal because it's a, to be high because it's an area of, of chronic kidney disease. 
and you want to do things like your iron studies where you want to see the saturation of iron just to roll out is it the reporting that is causing the problem or it is the iron that is causing the problem. Uh, if you still don't have a diagnosis, then you can move on to do even your B12 level. So you have done, and now you have confirmed that the cause is that they are lacking erythropoietin. So you can give them uh, erythropoietin, recombinant human erythropoietin, when, they, when their hemoglobin level is less than 10. It would normally be given twice weekly whenever they're coming for dialysis. And you want to target a hemoglobin level of 12 because it shall not be shown to be beneficial for, for giving erythropoietin when the hemoglobin level is around to the higher than 12. And also when you give EPO higher than that, they are being shown to have high risk of uh, thrombosis. Uh, they tend to get hypertension and also they tend to have a high risk of having a myocardial function. So another thing that occurs, another complication that occurs with CKD is the acidosis. They get, tend to get a metabolic acidosis. So you want to correct this acidosis uh, by either giving them a sodium carbonate, uh, sodium bicarb. So this sodium bicarb has also been shown to decrease the rate of progression of the CKD. But remember, because you're giving them sodium, and sodium will come now with water, which will now lead to increase in your blood pressure. You need to use it cautiously in patients who are known to be able to, to urinate their fluid. You need to restrict the fluid intake, especially for patients who are in in uh, end stage kidney disease. They have their kidneys, the residual function is really low. So you are we want to restrict the intake of their fluid. Then you want to also give them um, diuretics, especially for the patients who have some, some they're able to make some kidneys, some, some urine, sorry. We want to give them some, some diuretic just to help them with diuretic. Remember that this patient is diabetic, this patient is hypertensive, so they're also at risk of uh, cardiovascular diseases. This patient may also have dyslipidemia. So you need to think about this patient as a, as a whole, not just looking at the, uh, the CKD. So how do you differentiate, how do you decide that this patient has CKD and this patient has, this patient has been persistently low for less than 16 months per minute for the past, for more than three months, or they have a, um, evidence of renal abnormality, either function or structure for greater than three months. So what happens when you find a patient, this is the first time that you've seen a patient, and you're not sure what has been the GFR prior to that. You're not sure whether this proteinuria that you're seeing, is it a new thing? Is it an old thing? So how, how do you differentiate that this is, a, this is CKD and not an API? So you can either differentiate according to their, their, their complications that I've pointed out that the, of CKD, whereby they tend to have anemia, they tend to have uh, mineral bone disease. But you also have to remember that this patient, this patient whom we are seeing at that time, and you do not know what are their, how long this dysfunction has been. They could be having other comorbidities that are, is making them to present with anemia. They could be having other comorbidities that could also be making them to present with this uh, uh, derangement of their calcium or their phosphate. So anemia and CKD, CKD mineral bone disease, are not enough to to differentiate between an acute kidney injury and a chronic kidney injury. Another way that you can differentiate is using your renal ultrasound. Because by the time the patient now is going to stage five, as you said, now the problem is that they keep on losing so many nephrons. If the nephron is damaged, they, they heal with fibrosis, and then with time they get like fibrosis. So with time, these kidneys will tend to so a normal uh, kidney size between nine to 12. So you find a patient with a kidney size less than nine, then you can suspect that this patient has CKD and not an AKI because in AKI, because they do not have time for this damage to occur, they tend to have normal size uh, kidneys, which is between nine to 12. However, you have to remember that there are some causes of uh, CKD that can present with uh, normal or enlarged kidney sizes. 
These are things like diabetic nephropathy. If you catch it early, they tend to have enlarged sizes, enlarged kidneys due to this hyperfiltration and atrophy. So early stages of diabetic nephropathy, they may have uh, enlarged kidneys. You have to think of things like polycystic kidney disease. Because of this cyst, and they have really large cysts, the, the kidneys will be enlarged. Uh, things like amyloidosis with the deposit of the amyloid into the kidney, they will also have enlarged uh, kidney sizes. Things like HIV-associated nephropathy, they also have, they tend to have enlarged to, um, enlarged to normal size kidney. So again, uh, the renal ultrasound by itself is not, is not, of, is not enough because uh, there are other, other conditions that could still present with, uh, with enlarged size, large kidneys, yet this patient has CKD. So yeah, that marks the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Questions, clarifications? Yes, doctor, there's uh, one question in the chat box. The complications that you had mentioned, like the metabolic acidosis and the uh, Anemia, is it possible for all those complications to arise in one patient at one go, at like at a go? Yes, it is possible for this, all these complications to arise. Because I'm not going into details about these, uh, about these complications, but I think in levels in year six, we'll be taught about these complications. But all these complications tend to occur at different, uh, they have different rules of, of occurring. So if you think like something like anemia, we're just talking about erythropoietin, which is being caused by the decreased level of decreased nephrons that are functioning. If you think something like uh, the mineral bone disease is being caused by uh, lack of conversion of the vitamin D, which is still being caused by lack of enough uh, nephrons for it to occur. We think of things like acidosis. This patient is not able to make bike up to buffer, so which is also being caused by the fact that they are losing a lot of nephrons. This patient is not able to pee, so they will present with fluid overload. So it is possible for a patient at presentation, especially at end-stage kidney disease, which is at a GFR less than 15, they can present with all this complication at a go. Um, I've seen a question, when do you initiate dialysis? So dialysis, you want to initiate when, the, when you have a GFR of less than seven. Some school of thought talk about less than seven, but you want to wait. Okay, there are, uh, there are indications for initiating dialysis. It's not just that you see a patient today and you decide that this one, we are initiating dialysis. So maybe, remember they also have electrolyte imbalances. If this patient has persistent hyperkalemia, you have tried to correct it, you have tried to change their diet, and they're still not, um, they're still, they have, the hyperkalemia still uh, persists, that's an indication. If the patient has a fluid overload that has persisted and you've restricted their diet, you've tried to use um, diuretics, you can still, you can still initiate them on uh, on dialysis, if the patient presents with things like pulmonary edema, is also an indication to, to initiate dialysis. If the patient presents with things like metabolic acidosis, they, that's also an indication. So there are indications of when you initiate uh, dialysis, but most of these indications will tend to occur when a patient has an EGFR of less than seven. Um, seeing a question. Yes, uremic gastritis is a feature of, of, uh, of CKD. Uh, I didn't really go into the complications of CKD, but how we explain it is because of this uremia itself, it's toxic to the body. It's supposed to be supposed to be uh, excreted. And as I've said, it you can accumulate in the cardiac, giving you a pericarditis. It can accumulate in in the brain, giving you an encephalopathy. So if it accumulates in the gut, it will give you a gastritis. So it's just the accumulation of this uremia that leads to this uh, gastritis. So this patient. Even the nausea and the vomiting that I was mentioning, those are signs of um, uh, those are signs of uh, uremic gastritis. So, how does tertiary hyperparathyroidism come about? So, initially, uh, the hyperparathyroidism that comes about is because first we have no the vitamin D is not being co converted in the kidneys. So, initially, they present with a secondary hyperparathyroidism whereby they have a normal PTH, they have a high calcium, they have a low calcium, sorry, and a 
high phosphate. At this stage, what is really uh, driving this uh, hyperparathyroidism is this high phosphate that you're expecting that really should have been excreted by the kidneys. And remember that even uh, the, the excretion of uh, phosphate is under control of vitamin D, which this kidney is not able to make. So if this secondary hyperparathyroidism is not well managed, then they will progress to tertiary hyperparathyroidism. where now everything is high. They have a high calcium, they have a high phosphate, and also they have a high PTH. So how do you manage? You want to target, either you can target your PTH with your senior consent, or you can target your, your binders. You can bind the calcium, but binding then will be too late. So all you want to do is to give their senior consent. Uh, since CKD can present with normal, is there any other point? No, there is no other definitive pointer for CKD. So unless now you tie them up, we tie this patient, this patient has a normocytic number chronic anemia, has features showing you that they have mineral bone disease and they have things, maybe they have from their history, you can point out that they have history of diabetes or hypertension or other comorbidities put them at risk. Then we, even though they have normal size kidneys, then you can say that they are, they are actually in CKD, but there is no definitive uh, pointer that tells you that, um, that this patient has uh, CKD. Uh, do you still give loop directives to a patient with chronic kidney disease and also presenting with features of cardiac failure? Yeah, if this patient has a urinary output, because if this patient presents and is oliguric and you give them loop diuretics, it does not help them much. So if this patient has still has an output, maybe they're able to, to make like one liter in 24 hours, then yeah, you can still give them loop diuretics. It will help you with your potassium, which tends to accumulate in CKD, and will also help you with your, with, your, with your fluid overload, and will also now be helping you in your congestive cardiac failure. So if you are going to have a kidney transplant without correcting the initial cause that brought about CKD, would the same problem occur? Well, Ideally, if you catch this patient, this patient has CKD, presents to you, you want to, you want to catch them early when their kidney sizes are normal. So let's say in stage three, stage four, but you may have time to do your biopsy. So you do your biopsy and you try to figure out what is causing this. Uh, maybe it's not the diabetes and the hypertension. You're trying to figure out what other causes will be causing your, 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 your kidney failure. So let's say you get something like... Uh, membranous nephropathy, and this is not hereditary. So yeah, you can, you can transplant them. But if it is a hereditary cause, let's say you get something like a focus on microglomerosclerosis, you want, to, you want to advise this patient to get a donor from somebody who is not related to them. So if it's a couple, you can tell the husband or the wife to donate. But if this is something that you think that it is hereditary, Ideally, you should advise the patient to look for somebody who is not, hereditary, who is not uh, related to them, not to, to reduce the risk of each recurring. But yes, it can recur uh, if you do not, if the hereditary, if the cause of the kidney of the CKD was something hereditary. Even things like diabetes and hypertension. If the patient had the, if the diabetes and the hypertension was the cause of the CKD, if you do not well control them in the new kidney, it can still recur. So you really need to deal with the primary cause of the, the cause the kidney failure. So what cause is CKD in children less than 10 years if it's not hereditary? In children, most of the time is refrax nephropathy because of re recurrent UTI. If they have picture, if they have the basic urinary junction strictures, then they tend to have a lot of refrax nephropathy if they're not treated well with their, with their UTIs, they can present later with CKD. Can CKD at stage three or four be reversed with treatment? It can't really be reversed, but what you can do, because remember that diagram that I showed, the damage has already been done by the initiating, uh, initiating problem. So you really cannot uh, reverse this sclerosis. What you can do is that you can stop the progress. And stopping the progress is by blocking this uh, RAS, because RAS is what is making now the other remaining nephrons now to start failing. So we can't reverse it, but we can stop the progress. Uh, I think, yeah, there are no more other questions. Are there any other questions? No questions? And I can see also our time is also almost done. I don't know whether Prof was able to join us.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Gituku. Okay, you're welcome. I think I am done. Yes. Uh, Dr. Professor Recording Kahima stopped. said he will be joining us shortly. Okay. Uh, I think someone would like to say something. Right, let me allow them to unmute. No, this is Dr. Zoya. Caroline, if you're done, I can screen share. Or are we waiting for...